Father, we thank you so much for this time together as we continue our study together of the prophets and their words. Now we come to the prophets of the 6th century PC, uh, those who spoke uh, to Judah, warning them against your wrath uh, that was coming. Uh, I pray, Lord Jesus, that we too will be warned uh, through the prophets Jeremiah and Ezekiel. Um, and I pray that you help us to appreciate the similarities between their time and our time so that uh, your word uh, to them uh, can become your word to us today. Praise in your son's name. Amen. So you can see the questions. I hope you see all the questions there. I'm, I expect us to, to, to do a quiz of that. You, you, should, you should answer those as we go through the lectures. At the end, we'll mark it. And uh, and this is why, I mean, I think we've emphasized it uh, enough last week. Please mark your work and then send me your marks, right, uh, after this. The exception is for people who didn't do it before, uh, like Shashi and them, then they can do it, write down their, their answers, and they can send to me and I'll mark it. Uh, anyway, okay, so those are the questions. You're able to see them, okay? What were the three exiles of Judah? When did the Babylonian exile return? I don't have to go through that. I think you can see that. Okay, let me start. The three Babylonian exiles. Now, there were three Babylonian exiles. The first was the exile of Daniel and his friends uh, in the year 606 uh, to 605 BC. So it's probably December to January, December of 606 to January of 605. And here is Daniel, Daniel chapter 1, verses 1 to 4, and he's telling us about the exile. Uh, in the third year of the reign of King Jehoiakim of Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to Jerusalem, laid siege to it. The Lord handed King Jehoiakim of Judah over to him, along with some of the vessels from the house of God. Nebuchadnezzar carried them to the land of Babylon, to the house of his God, and put the vessels in the treasury of his God. The king ordered Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the Israelites from the royal family and from the nobility, young men without any physical defect, good-looking, suitable for instruction in all wisdom, knowledgeable, perceptive, and capable of serving in the king's palace. He was to teach them the Chaldean language and literature, the king assigned them daily provisions from the royal food and from the wine that he drank. They were to be trained for three years. And at the end of that time, they were to attend to the king. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You see, this is the first university, formal university studies. It was this university of Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon, where he took the exile. So it was this time the exile was selective. So he was selecting, do you see the, the uh, standard for selection was that it will be uh, the people from the royal family, from the nobility. So Daniel and his friends must have come from the royal families of Judah. They were young men without any physical defect, good looking, suitable. So you have to be fit physically uh, as well as uh, wise and knowledgeable and per uh, perceptive. So capable of serving. So they were taken. So this is the exile. They were taken from Judah to Babylon. These are young guys, probably 16, 17. Uh, in, in, you know, they, they were still young boys and were taken to Babylon. They, and they have to study in the University of Nebuchadnezzar for three years under Nebuchadnezzar's scholarship. So it was sponsored by the king from his um, food and wine. So and, and they studied for three years and then they would serve in the government of King Nebuchadnezzar. Ganesa. So, but that was the first exile, right? It was not a, uh, it was not like a mass exile of everyone. It was selective. So Daniel and his friends got to remember that. The second exile was that of King Jehoiakim. Now Jehoiakim uh, is also known uh, with another name, uh, 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 Jeconiah. Jeconiah. Jehoiakim and Jeconiah is the same guy, okay? So this is the year now is 597. So 606 to 597, probably about 10 years, right? Uh, you remember it, it goes backward, right? The years are counted backwards. So 606 comes before 957. 
So 957 BC, this is the exile of King Jehoiakim or King Chekoniah and the prophet Ezekiel. So Ezekiel was part of that exile. So he took them. So this is the account of the exile, uh, 2 Kings 24. Jehoiakim. Now Jehoiakim was the son of Jehoiakim. Now um, Daniel was talking about the third year of King Jehoiakim, right? So that's the father of this guy, right? And Jehoiakim uh, ruled for 11 years and he died. And this is his son, Jehoiakim. He only ruled for three months, right? And this is what happened. Jehoiakim was 18 years old when he became king. And he reigned three months in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Nehushta, daughter of El, uh, El Nathan. She was from Jerusalem. He did what was evil in the Lord's sight, just as his father had done. At that time, the servants of King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon marched up to Jerusalem, and the city came under siege. King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to the city while his servants were besieging it. Besieging it. King Jehoiakim of Judah, along with his mother, his servants, his commanders, and his officials, surrendered to the king of Babylon. So the king of Babylon took him captive um, in the eighth year of his reign. He also carried off from there all the treasures of the Lord's temple uh, and the treasures of the king's palace. And he cut into pieces all the gold articles that King Solomon of Israel had made for the Lord's sanctuary. Uh, just uh, as the Lord had predicted. He deported all Jerusalem and all the commanders and all the best soldiers, 10,000 captives, including all the craftsmen and metalsmiths, except for the poorest people of the land. No one remained. It's the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So you see that um, this is a, a kind of a, a major exile. It, it says that he deported, he deported up to uh, 10,000 people uh, from Jerusalem at the time. So this is 597. So the king, Jehoiakim, uh, as well as um, Ezekiel, the prophet, went along in his exile to um, Babylon. Now, they left some people in, uh, in Israel. The, the temple was not yet destroyed at that time. Uh, and um, they set up King Zedekiah. Now, King Zedekiah was the brother of King Jehoiakim, uh, and he was the son of King Josiah. Now, you may have heard of King Josiah. He was the king who became king when he was eight years old, and he found the book of the law in the temple, and eventually, as a result, there was a great reformation of religion uh, in Judah. He destroyed all the idols, the Baal worship, all the, uh, the shrines, the religious shrines They were set up, against the Lord. So it was a great reformation in the time of Josiah. Now these are his sons. So three of his sons rule and uh and and a, and a grandson. His grandson was King Jehoiakim, who was uh taken with Ezekiel. Now, and then his son, King Zedekiah, who is the Jehoiakim's uncle, uh he became the ruler of uh, Jerusalem. And uh so that was the, the third exile. The third exile happened uh um in the King Zedekiah and Jeremiah in the year 586 BC uh, when they were taken. Now, the return of the exile, the exile did not return uh, until uh, the, um, the uh, reign of King Cyrus of Persia in 539 BC. Now, we can read about it here in, uh, in 2 Corinthians 36, verse 23. This is what King Cyrus of Persia says. The Lord, the God of the heavens, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and has appointed me to build him a temple at Jerusalem in Judah. Any of his people among you may go up and may the Lord his God be with him. So you see, he's, um, the mission of those who returned from the exile in Babylon was to rebuild a temple in Jerusalem. They were so looking forward to it. Uh, that the, that by rebuilding the temple that the Babylonians had destroyed, uh, the Lord will return to Jerusalem uh, and uh, establish his kingdom in Jerusalem. And this was their expectation up to the time when Jesus came. That's why Jesus started his ministry in Galilee by saying, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is near. Because that was the expectation 
ever since their return from the exile, that the kingdom of God will come, but it never came, right? They rebuilt the temple, but the uh, kingdom did not come. And so they were still waiting for it. And, and in fact, you know, we, uh, the, that kingdom has now been established with Jesus ruling from the right hand of God, giving us his Holy Spirit so that we ourselves become a testimony and witnesses for Jesus. Uh, speaking to others about Jesus and then inviting them to come to Jesus because, you see, the kingdom is now under Jesus who is ruling the universe from the right hand of God, right? But when Jesus returns, uh, then the world, all the kingdoms of the world will become the kingdom of the Lord and his Christ, that is, Jesus Christ. But anyway, so they return. Uh, and their mission was to rebuild the temple with the hope that the kingdom of God will then be established. And then the prophets who were working uh, in those times were Haggai and Zechariah. Now, their roles was to uh, encourage those who returned from the exile to rebuild the temple. So here's uh, Ezra, chapter 5, uh, verses 1 and 2. But when the prophets Haggai and Zechariah, son of Edo, prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel, who was over them, Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, and Yeshua, son of Yozadak, began to rebuild God's house in Jerusalem. The prophets of God were with them, helping them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So you see the prophets were also helping the rebuilding of the second temple. That's what is called the second temple, the temple of Zerubbabel. Son of Shealtiel. Now Shealtiel is the son of Jeconiah, the king Jehoiakim, right? So when they were taken to um, to Babylon, uh, so this is Shealtiel, the um, son of Jeconiah, and uh, so uh, Jerubbabel is his um, grandson. Now you remember, I told you that um, the Bible says only a son of David. Or build a temple because that's the promise in 2 Samuel 7, right? Your son, your your uh, your offspring coming from your uh, your uh, your bosom, right? Your womb will be the one. So that's why Solomon was the builder of the first temple, Zerubbabel was the, the builder of the second temple, and Jesus, the son of David, is the builder of the third and eternal temple, right? The temple that we belong. Remember, we belong to that temple. What, what Peter, you know, remember what Peter is saying, 1 Peter 2, verses 4 and 5, you have come to the living stone upon which you are being built up to be the spiritual house, right? Uh, and, and you become, you, all of us become the holy priesthood of God, serving God within this holy, uh, this spiritual house, spiritual temple, the third and eternal temple. We serve God. Uh, by offering spiritual sacrifices. So, so we don't need to offer any more physical uh, uh, sacrifices. Why? Because Jesus has, has fulfilled all that. See, this is why, you know, there, even though there's still some Christians who are looking to Israel, to Jerusalem, where a third physical temple will be rebuilt, uh, we say uh, that that is, uh, that is not going to happen because according to the Bible, even if it's going to happen, it's not the fulfillment of the uh, prophecies about the temple. Uh, in the Old Testament, because the prophecies about the temple in the Old Testament is now fulfilled in Christ, and we as his people are his temple. So his temple are a people temple. It's not a physical temple anymore. It's a it's a people temple because he's the one who is building us up on the foundation that is the prophets and the apostles um, at uh, uh, in the Bible. So so there you are, right? Um, the return in 539, Prophets Haggai and Zechariah were encouraging Zerubbabel, uh, the grandson of uh, King Jehoiakim, uh, Jehoiakim uh, to rebuild the temple. And then Malachi, of course, Malachi was also uh, another prophet who spoke uh, after the return of the Babylonian exile, and he was speaking about the coming day of the Lord. So here is Malachi chapter 4, verse 1, for look, the day is coming. So he's talking about the day of the Lord burning like a furnace when all the arrogant and everyone who commits wickedness will become stubble. The coming day will consume them, says the Lord of armies, not leaving them root or prances. But for you, fear my name, son of righteousness will rise 
with healing in its wings. So you see those on, on that day, there will be a distinction between those who are uh, um, resisting the gospel and those of us who have believed and surrendered our lives to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We will shine like uh, the sun, but the others will be burned like stubble. Okay, so but that's uh, Malachi who spoke after the return of the exile. Now the prophet Jeremiah and his time. He started ministry according to Jeremiah on the thirteenth year of King Josiah. So this is Jeremiah chapter chapter one and two. Uh, the words of Jeremiah the son of Hilkiah, one of the priests living in Anathoth in the territory of Benjamin. Now, Ezekiel and Jeremiah are both priests who became prophets. See, remember we said uh, that the priest, the Levitical priest, they were the teachers of the Bible in Israel. The written word of God was given to the Levites, the Levitical priest, and they were the teachers. They were, were not the prophets. The prophets were the ones who were delivering the word of God to the com contemporary situation. But the written word of God, the book of the law that was written by Moses during his time, and uh, even these prophetic books, it was given to the Levites to um, to teach them. So now here's Jeremiah and Ezekiel. They're meant to be teaching the written word, but also speaking to Israel the very word of God through revelation. Um, and remember, we said that even the prophetic uh, role today is shared by both men and women. Women should always wear a, uh, a head veil, cover their heads with a head veil, uh, and, and they, they give a revelation or a word from God or a song or something uh, or a teaching they have heard somewhere else, and they give it to edify, to build up the, the church of God. And I want to encourage you, uh, the male, remember that um, to say that the, that the women can't uh, teach the church doesn't mean they cannot teach anything. Yes, they cannot teach in a church situation, but they can teach children uh, and, and youth. They can do that Sunday schools. Uh, they can teach there. They can teach other women. Um, and so, and even they can speak, they can lead in prayer for the whole church. So that's why uh, our women can lead our prayer, our Lord who fear. They can also uh, yeah, bring a word of prophecy, a word, uh, you know, to, to share with the people uh, something from the word of God. This is what I'm encouraging uh, our women also to come in through our WhatsApp uh, platform and share what um, you've got through the reading God. So that's an opportunity for you to prophesy, to speak God's words for the edification of, of God's church. Okay, so those are the, uh, but anyway, so here is uh, Jeremiah, the word of the Lord, verse two, the word of the Lord came to him in the 13th year of the reign of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah. Uh, and then uh, it says, uh, will, it will continue. But anyway, so 13th year, of King Josiah. Now remember, King Josiah uh, started a ruling when he was eight years old. So the thirteenth year, he was twenty-one at the time. That's when they found the book of the law in the temple and started this great reformation of religion in Israel. So uh, Jeremiah started then in, the, in those times. He spoke God's words about the year uh, six hundred and thirty or six hundred and twenty-nine BC. See, because he was a young boy when he started, which we shall see. But he spoke for 42 years, very long time, 42 years before the word of God was, uh, was, that was given to him was fulfilled. Imagine that. I mean, you have to hang around for 42 years until you see the word of God being fulfilled. That is, the Babylonians came and destroyed Jerusalem. But throughout his whole time, he was a, a suffering prophet. No one believed him. He was beaten up a few times, right, by some other prophets and some uh, religious um, um, rulers of the temple. So he was beaten up. He was imprisoned several times. Uh, and the thing is, where he he he, spe he he speaks about, he spoke about this uh, in in chapter fifteen and chapter twenty of Jeremiah, where he said, "Lord, even when I want to stop talking about your word, uh, your word is is almost like." Um, um, yeah, your, your word is like fire in my stomach. I couldn't stop speaking about it. Okay? Uh, and so he had to keep on speaking. But anyway, so 42 years, because you see, this is, um, this is um, Jeremiah 3 continues on. It also came throughout the days of Jehoiakim. Remember, King Jehoiakim's rule 
It was during his rule that Daniel as his friends, the third year of his reign, Daniel and his friends were taken in exile. Uh, but then he died, and then his son Jehoiakim uh, became king for three months, and they were taken in exile to Babylon. So, uh, so Jehoiakim, the son of King jo of Josiah, king of Judah, until the fifth month of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, son of Josiah, king of Judah, when the people of Jerusalem went into exile. So that was the, the total exile upon which um, Zedekiah and Jeremiah, and that and that's the the last one, the 586 BC exile. But anyway, so he spoke for 42 years before his words were fulfilled. The world of Jeremiah. Now, during his time, remember Assyria was the was like uh, the great superpower, like China. I, I regard that the great superpower in the world today is China, okay? because he's like a big bully around all the nations. Right? He's going around, even Australia is afraid of him. Uh, our government so weak here. Uh, we uh, in America that they've so given in so much to this. We need a strong leader in the West to stand up and go against China. It's the it is the China is the superpower in the world right now. And Russia, Russia, I think they, they, there's a partnership between China and Russia, and that's going to be very dangerous for the world if those two superpowers will uh, be allowed to, to dominate. But you see. Uh, that this only happens because America has got a, re a really weak leader at the moment uh, in Biden, right? And I'm hoping that they won't rig the election again so that Trump can come into power. But anyway, we don't trust in human beings. But during the time of Jeremiah, Babylon destroyed Assyria, the great superpower. That Remember, that it was Assyria who took the uh, northern kingdom of Israel into exile in the year 722 BC. So six uh, 612 BC, is so almost like a hundred years after the the exile of Israel in 722, Assyrians were destroyed by the Babylonians. Uh, so here is uh, here is the prophecies about the, the destruction of Babylon, of of Assyria. Sorry, the Assyria will fall, but not by human sword. A sword will devour him, but not one made by man. He will flee from the sword. His young men will be put. Uh, to forced labor. His rock will pass over. Anyway, so uh, yeah, I think in fact um, it is. it was Babylon, but I think what Isaiah is saying here, it was not the sword of Babylon. It, it was because God has given his sword uh, of justice. Yes, the Lord has a sword of justice as he gives it to whoever he is pleased with. He gave it to the, to the Babylonians in order to destroy the Assyrians. And then, uh, so so there it was, uh, the, the words of the prophet Isaiah was fulfilled. Uh, and prophet Isaiah was saying uh, in Isaiah 14 uh, that, um, you know, the plan, uh, the Lord of armies has sworn as I have purpose, so it will be as I have planned it, so it will happen. I will break Assyria in my land. I will dread him down on my mountain, then his yoke will be taken from them. And his burden will be removed from their shoulders. This is the plan prepared for the whole earth. And this is the hand stretched out against the nations. The Lord of armies himself has planned it. Therefore, who can stand in its way? It is his hand that is outstretched. So who can turn it back? So you see that the Lord, whatever happens in the world, the Lord is in control. His people went into exile. Yes, the Lord is in control. It's not because he was weak. And therefore, the, his, the enemies of his people uh, became victorious over them. It was because of his people's sin. See, uh, Christians and the church of God only become very weak because of sin. But when we tolerate sin uh, within the church, and, 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 and that kind of church will be destroyed. That's what will happen to the Methodist church or even the global Methodist church. I still don't believe global Methodist church is any, any much different from uh, the Methodist church. Um, that they're still uh, allowing women pastors, which is unbiblical. Anyway, so um, so Babylon, in other words, Babylon becomes then the uh, superpower of the time. So um, and, and destroyed, defeated um, uh, Egypt. Uh, so here is uh, uh, Egypt was the other contender against Babylon. And here is uh, Egypt. Uh, the, the, the thing about Egypt in uh, Jeremiah 46 about Egypt and the army of Pharaoh Nego, uh, Egypt, Egypt's king, which was defeated at Carchemish 
on the Euphrates River by King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon in the fourth year of King Judas, uh, of uh, Judas King Jehoiakim, son of Judah. You may remember, you may recall, it was the third year of King. Um, oh, sorry, now this is the fourth year. Uh, yeah, so the third year was of King Jehoiakim was when Daniel and his friends were taken into exile, and then fourth year Nebuchadnezzar was fighting Egypt and destroying them, and so became the sole ruler uh, or the sole superpower of the world at the time. So Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians. So during uh, the the uh, prophetic work of uh, of uh, Jeremiah, um, so the Babylonians defeated the Assyrians and the Egyptians and therefore became superpower of the time. Now, the kings of Judah, during which time so Jeremiah spoke, uh, there were four of them, King Josiah. So remember, um, here is a here is a, a reflecting back um, of Jeremiah during his ministry. Uh, in Jeremiah 36, take a scroll and write on it all the words I have spoken to you concerning Israel, Judah, and all the nations, from the time I first spoke to you during Josiah's reign until, until the day. Perhaps when the house of Judah hears about all the disaster I'm planning to bring on them, each one of them will turn from his evil way, then I will forgive their iniquity and their sin. So then Jeremiah, of course, spoke the word to Baruch. Baruch was his scribe, the person who was writing down his word, and he wrote um, the book. And, and so this was... This is uh, evidence of, of the writing of the prophets, right? So the Lord told Jeremiah to write down what he has spoken since the time of Josiah. Remember, we saw he, he started on the 13th year of King Josiah. So King Josiah was the first king during which he uh, Jeremiah spoke. And then after King Josiah, it was the time of his son. Now, King Jehoiakim did something bad, right? Listen to this. The king, that is, this is King Jehoiakim. So this is, uh, remember, we, we are, what I read before is the beginning of this chapter, chapter 36 of Jeremiah. The Lord told Jeremiah to start writing all the words that he'd spoken to Israel so that when it's read to them, hopefully they will turn. Okay. Now the word of Jeremiah, the written word, is now read to the king, King Jehoiakim. Now here is what happened when the king heard the written word of Jeremiah. The king sent Yehudi to get the scroll, and he took it from the chamber of Elishama, the scribe. Uh, Yehudi, or Jehudi, uh, then read it uh, in the hearing of the king and all the officials who were standing by the king. Since it was the nine month, the king was sitting uh, in his winter quarters with a fire burning in front of him. Uh, as soon as Yehudi would read, uh, would read three or four columns, Jehoiakim would cut the scroll with the scribe's knife and throw the columns into the fire in the hearth uh, until the entire scroll was consumed by the fire in the hearth. As they heard all these words, the king and all his servants did not become terrified or tear their clothes, even though Elnathan, Deliah, and Gemariah had urged the king not to burn the scroll, he did not listen to them. See, and then he commanded um, Jeremiah to be arrested and that sort of thing. Do you see how hardened their hearts was, even hearing the written word of God? The king burned it, right? Um, very bad. So that's during the time of Jehoiakim. You see, imagine how the prophet Jeremiah felt, right? You know, this should be the expectation of uh, pastors like myself and Pasi and others. We preach to people that turn their itching ears away from the word of God. Right, uh, even here the king burned the word. See, it, it's almost like people would want to burn the word that was speaking there. But anyway, then Jehoiakim during the Jeho uh, Jehoiajin his time, we read it before about um, you know Jehoiakim rested with his ancestors and his son Jehoiakim became king in his place, and then the king of Egypt came up right, and then uh, King Zedekiah. So here is the. King Zedekiah and the fall of Jerusalem during the time of, of, uh, of uh, Jeremiah. In the ninth year of King Zedekiah of Judah, in the tenth month, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon advanced against Jerusalem with his entire army and laid siege to it. 
in the fourth month of Zedekiah's eleventh year, on the ninth day of the month, the city was broken into. All the officials of the king of Babylon entered and sat at the middle gate. Nekosariza, Samka, Nebuzazakim, and the chief of staff, Nekosariza, the chief of uh, Susea, and all the rest of the officials of Babylon's king. When King Zedekiah of Judah and all the fighting men saw them, they fled. They left the city at night by way of the king's garden, through the city gate, between the two walls. They left along the route to the Arabah. However, the Chaldean army pursued them and overtook Zedekiah in the plains of Jericho. They arrested him and brought him up to Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon's king at Ripla, in the land of Hamath. King passed sentence on him there at Ripla. The king of Babylon slaughtered Zedekiah's sons before his eyes, and he also slaughtered all Judah's nobles. Then he blinded Zedekiah and put him in bronze chains to take him to Babylon. The Chaldeans next burned down the king's palace and the people's houses and tore down the walls of Jerusalem. Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guards, deported the rest of the people to Babylon. Those who had remained in the city and those deserters who had defected to him, along with the rest of the people who were remain. So you see that this is what happened, right? During King Zedekiah. So the city of Jerusalem was siege for two years. From the ninth year of Zedekiah to the eleventh year, two years of siege, man, that's a long time. They must have finished all their food and start eating their children because that's what the prophets were saying to them. That's what the Lord was saying to them that will happen because they have not resisted to listen to the Lord's word. Now, Jeremiah was captured in his exile, and here is the account of his capture in chapter 40. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord after Nebuzaradan, captain of the guards, released him at Ramah. When he found him, he was bound in chains with all the uh, exiles of Jerusalem and Judah who were being exiled to Babylon. See, so Jeremiah was bound, and he was part of those who were meant to be exiled to Babylon. The captain of the guards took Jeremiah and said to him, The Lord your God decreed this disaster. And this. So even the the general of the Babylonian army, he heard what Jeremiah was saying. Because that's what Jeremiah was saying. The city will be given to the king of, of Babylon. And he was urging the kings of Judah to surrender to the king of, of Babylon. So to save himself and to save the city. But he resisted. And therefore, so this is what uh, Nebuzaradan, the, uh, the general, the captain of the guards, who sent to Jeremiah, the Lord your God decreed this disaster on this place. And the Lord has fulfilled it. He has done just what he decreed because you people have sinned against the Lord and have not obeyed him. This thing has happened. See, I mean, it's a shame that that uh, this is a, a, a captain of the foreign army and he saw clearly what had happened. And, 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 and But the people of Judah didn't see that. They didn't see it was their sin. So this guy is saying, look, we didn't, we didn't uh, win the war against you because you were weak. We win the war against you because you were sinful. And this is why we're taking you uh, away. Now, pay attention. Today, I'm setting you free from the chains that were on your hands. If it pleases you to come with me to Babylon, come and I will take care of you. But if it seems wrong to you to come with me to Babylon, go no further. Look, the whole land is in front of you. Wherever it seems good and right for you to go, go there. And Jeremiah had not yet turned to go. Nebuchadnezzar said to him, Return to Gedaliah, son of Ahikam, son of Shaphan, whom the king of Babylon had appointed over the city of Judah, and stay with him among the people, or go wherever it seems right for you to go. So the captain of the guard gave him a ration and a gift and released him. So Jeremiah, so Jeremiah was released to stay back in Judah with the governor that they, because, uh, the Babylonians set up this guy called Gedaliah to be the governor. That he was assassinated by some of the king's relatives who were still hiding. They were from the army uh, and uh, they were hiding around somewhere in Judah. And they came and they assassinated him and then took the, the rest of the people with Jeremiah to Egypt. And I believe Jeremiah died in Egypt. Now, Jeremiah's prophetic role. Now, he's called a prophet. He was a boy. Jeremiah 1, I juice you before I formed you in the womb. I set you apart before you were born. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. 
But I protested. So this is Jeremiah. Oh, no, Lord God, look, I don't know how to speak since I'm only a youth. Yes, he was only a young boy, probably 16, 17, when, when the Lord called him uh, to become a prophet. So, you see, I mean, see, the Lord is in that business of making young people like that. Uh, to become great prophets who bring the word of God. And this is our prayer for Pastor Pasi, Pastor Penny. Uh, they're only young, but uh, but the, hopefully the Lord will raise them up like Jeremiah, put his word in their mouth to speak boldly and fearlessly to the generations to come by the word of God. So his prophetic duty there in verse uh, in chapter 1, verses 9, now, now fill your mouth with my words. See, I've appointed you today over nations and kingdoms, to uproot and tear down, to destroy and demolish, to build and plant. Now that's his um so that's his prophetic call. His word is to destroy and overthrow. So the book of Jeremiah is divided exactly into two big divisions according to that. Chapter one, chapters one to twenty-nine is his word, the word of Jeremiah is to destroy and overthrow God's people. And then chapters thirty to fifty-two, the last part of the book is about building and planting Israel again. So here's an example. Here's an example of the word of destruction that came to them. Um, this is the word that came to Jeremiah concerning all the people of Judah in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, which was the first year of King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. The prophet Jeremiah spoke concerning all the people of Judah and all the residents of, of Jerusalem as follows. From the 13th year of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah, until this very day, 23 years, the word of the Lord has come to me. And I have spoken to you time and time again, but you have not obeyed. The Lord sent all his servants and prophets to you time and time again, but you have not obeyed or even paid attention. He announced, turn each of you from your evil way of life and from your evil deeds, live in the land. The Lord gave to you and your ancestors long ago and forever. Do not follow other gods to serve them and to bow and worship them. And do not anger me by the works of your hand. And I will do you no harm. But you've not obeyed me. This is the Lord's declaration. With the result that you have angered me by the work of your hands and brought disaster on yourself. Therefore, this is what the Lord of armies says. Because you have not obeyed my words, I am going to send for all the families of the north. This is the Lord's declaration and send for my servant Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. And I will bring them against this land, against residents, against uh, all these surrounding nations. I will completely destroy them, make them an example of horror and scorn and ruins forever. I will eliminate the sound of joy and gladness from them, the voice of the groom and the pride the sound of the millstones and the light of the lamb, this whole land will become a desolate ruin, and this nation will serve the king of Babylon for 70 years. It's the word of the Lord. Thanks for you. So you see, they're going to go into exile for 70 years. But the sins of Judah is, I'll give you an example of the sins of Judah. So here's what they do. Jeremiah 7. But you keep trusting in deceitful words that cannot help. Do you still murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, burn incense to Baal and follow other gods that you have not known? Then do you come and stand before me in this house that bears my name and say, we are rescued so we can continue doing all these detestable acts? Has this house which bears my name become a den of robbers in your view? Yes, I too have seen it. This is the Lord's declaration. Um, but return to my place that was at Shiloh, where I make my name dwell at first. See what I did to it because of the evil of my people Israel. Now, because you have done all these things, this is the Lord's declaration. And because I have spoken to you time and time again, but you wouldn't listen. And I've called to you, but you wouldn't answer. What I did to Shiloh, I will do to the house that bears my name, the house in which you trust, the place that I gave you and your ancestors. I will banish you from my presence, just as I banished all your brothers, all the descendants of Ephraim. Just the word of the Lord. Thanks for you. But you see what they did? They trusted in the in the temple. They so they 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 were saying, look, you know, the Lord's going to destroy us, so let's continue sinning. And we'll come to church on Sunday. So church was almost like the 
security for continuing to sin. It was an insurance to continue sinning. So the Lord is saying, no, you can't do that. Your life must be changed. If you come to my church, you must be changed. And therefore, he is going to destroy them, take them away for 70 years. Now, the word, his word to build is this, an example of it. Uh, is Jeremiah 32. This is one of our prayer points, is this? Uh, because I believe it applies to us now as sons of Abraham through Jesus. Okay, uh, So the words to them is also the word to us as well. So I will certainly gather them. Jeremiah 32, verse 37 to 41. I will certainly gather them from all the lands where I have banished them in my anger, fury, and intense wrath. And I will return them to this place and make them live in safety. They will be my people and I will be their God. I will give them integrity of heart and action so they will fear me always for their good and for the good of their descendants after them. I will make a permanent covenant with them. I will never turn away from doing good to them and I will put fear of me in their hearts so they will never again turn away from me. I will take delight in them to do what is good for them and with all my heart and mind, I will faithfully plan them. In so he's promising to replant them in the land. And we pray that the Lord will plant us as well as his church in Honolulu, continuing for years to come. Now, the similarities of Jeremiah's time and our time. So this is an example of what you might do, um, you know, when you're writing your uh, your Facebook post, right? Um, yeah, uh, just explaining, you know, one of the things that you learn is that the, because of the similarities of our time and the time of the prophets, their words can be applied to us. So just as Jer Jeremiah's word is to destroy and overthrow, so also Jesus' word, right? Jesus already said, do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left upon another or will be thrown down. So everything will be destroyed. And so Peter says that that will come, that will be happening on the day of the Lord. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. On that day, the heavens will pass away with a loud noise the elements will burn and be dissolved and the earth and the works in it will be disclosed. And, and therefore, see, everything will be destroyed, dissolved, right, by fire. And Jesus, But just as Jeremiah's word is to build and to plant, so also God will renew all things, right? So this is uh, Revelation 21, that I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. I also saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared like a, a bride adorned, adorned for a husband. So there will be a new earth and a new heavens. There will be a new Jerusalem, the city where we will all live um, with the Lord. So how shall we live in the light of this? Well, let's just go to 2 Peter 3.14. Therefore, dear friends, while you wait for these things, you remember what Peter was saying? Everything will be destroyed with fire. While we wait for these things, make every effort to be found without spot or blemish in his sight at peace. Also regard the patience of our Lord as salvation. Okay? So God is patient with us, giving us time. This is why he's delaying his coming so we may turn to him and repent and be saved. Now, and that's, that's the prophet uh, Ezekiel, um, Jeremiah. The prophet Ezekiel in his time. He started prophesying in the fifth year of King Jehoiakim's exile. So remember, we said that's the second exile. First exile is Daniel and his friends. Second exile is uh, King Jehoiakim and, and, and Ezekiel. Now, in the 13th year of the fourth month, on the fifth day of the month, while I was among the exiles by the Kippah Canal, that's a canal, a river in Babylon, the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. On the fifth day of the month, it was the fifth year of the King, of King Jehoiakim's exile. Now, the exile of uh, King Jehoiakim began in 597. So the fifth year after that is probably 593 BC. So you see, this is still about six, seven years before 586. That he's also speaking to warn Israel against what happened um, when, when the Babylonian will come. But you see, the story of Ezekiel centered around the three big events, right? Firstly, it's the revelation of the Lord's glory in Babylon. That's, uh, that's Ezekiel 1. Remember what we said? He, he said he saw the glory of God, right? The heavens were open. There he sang. And I saw visions of God. So he saw, so what he saw was there was the throne of God that was in Jerusalem 
in the temple was coming across, was a mobile throne, right? Like a chariot coming, carrying the throne of God. He's coming across the river and he's looking. He's, he's surprised to see that the throne of God that was supposed to be in the temple in Jerusalem is coming across to a river to come and, and stay with those who are in exile in Babylon. So he knew something must have happened. But this is what he saw on top of the of the mobile throne, the chariot throne of God. He saw something like a throne with the appearance of lapis lazuli. Lapis lazuli is something uh, blue, like sky blue, I believe, was above the expense over the heads. On the throne high above was someone who looked like a human, right? From what seemed to be his waist up, I saw a gleam like ember with what looked like fire enclosing it all around, what seemed to be his waist down also saw what looked like fire. There was brilliant light all around him. The appearance of the brilliant light all around was like that of a rainbow in a cloud on a rainy day. This was the appearance of the likeness of the Lord's glory. When I saw it, I fell face down and heard a voice speaking. So there you see this great throne of God, there's the rainbow surrounding it because it's the promise of God. Remember that's his promise in uh, Genesis 9 that he will not destroy it. So he's, it's his mercy. It's a sign of his mercy, right? Unfortunately, it's being used by the homosexuals, the sign of the homosexuals. I believe for them it becomes a sign of God's wrath against them. One day they will come to experience it. Anyway, departure of the Lord's glory from... So the Lord appeared to Ezekiel in Babylon and um, he comes across... And so we know that uh, in 11.16, Ezekiel, uh, the Lord says, this is what the Lord says, though I send them far away. So he's talking about Ezekiel and King Jehoiakim and the exile that went in 597. Though I send them far away among the nations and scattered them among the countries, yet for a little while I have been a sanctuary for them in the countries where they have gone. So in other words, you remember the, the, the throne of God was mobile in the wilderness when he moved around with a tabernacle, the tent of meeting. They moved around with him. So it was a mobile throne. And this is why he resisted when David wanted to build a house for him because he said, look, I didn't ask for a house. I've always traveled with my people. So here is um, Ezekiel. And then then the, the, the second big event that Ezekiel is trying to understand is the departure of the Lord's glory from Jerusalem. So he first saw the Lord's glory coming on the throne to stay with them, become their sanctuary in the midst of the exiles in Babylon. Then the Lord took him to see what has happened in Jerusalem because he has left the temple, right? That is sanctioning and securing the temple to be destroyed. So this is ch chapter 10, verses 4 and 5. This is what he saw. Then the glory of the Lord rose from above the Jerob to the threshold of the temple. The temple was filled with the cloud, and the court was filled with the brightness of the Lord's glory. The sound of the Jerobim's wing could be heard as far as the outer God. It was like the voice of God Almighty when he speaks. See, this is, uh, you remember he was... Uh, he was the, his throne was on top of the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holy. But now Ezekiel is seeing them, they're rising up. The, the, the Jerubim that was thrown on the wall, remember that's what, um, uh, th there were two Jerubims, you know, their wings was uh, uh, were, were kind of like an umbrella to the, to the Ark of the Covenant inside the Holy of Holies. So that's what the Solomon built in the temple. But he saw that those Jerubims become alive. And they move and they're going with the glory of the Lord, taking the glory of the Lord out to, from there. And so if you drop down to verses um, 18 and 19, you see something tragic happening because the Lord is now leaving them. And the glory of the Lord moved away from the threshold. So he's leaving the temple now, right? So he came and he stood at the, at the gateway of the temple outside in the threshold of the temple. And he stopped above the Jerobim. It's almost like the Lord didn't want to leave, right? Sad, because he had uh, promised that his name will remain in this house forever. But because of their sins, so the Lord comes here and he says, see, I, I'm sure that the Lord is saying he loves his people. He knew that once he's departing from this, that the whole place will be destroyed. So the cherubim lifted their wings, ascended from the earth right before my eyes. The wheels were beside them and they went. 
The glory of the Lord God of Israel was above them, and it stopped at the entrance to the eastern gate of the Lord's house. See, it stopped. That's the entrance where they would enter every morning, every evening to do the morning sacrifice, the evening sacrifice. It stopped there for a little while, and then it goes. And then they went. The Lord, the glory of the Lord departed. So that's the second main event. The first event was the revelation of the glory of God to the people in Babylon, the exile in Babylon. The second was the departure of God's glory from Jerusalem so that the temple would be destroyed. And the third one was the returning of the glory of the Lord to Jerusalem. And if you look at, that's uh, chapter 40 to 48, the vision of the great temple. But at the end of the book, Jeremiah, um, uh, Ezekiel 48, 35, the perimeter of the city will be six miles. And the name of the city from that day will be the Lord is there. So the Lord comes back. Well, but of course, you know, it didn't happen. Right, they they built the temple. It didn't happen right, until Jesus. So that's the similarities between uh, their time of Ezekiel and us. Just as the Lord's glory was revealed to Ezekiel, so also it's been revealed to us. Right, John one fourteen, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We observed His glory, the glory is the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. The second thing, the Lord of the, the, the Lord's glory departed from Ezekiel. Jesus departed from us also, but promised to be with us. So here is 2 Corinthians 6. Do not be yoked together with those who do not believe. For what partnership is there between righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship does uh, light have with darkness? What agreement does Christ have with Belial? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? And what agreement does the temple of God have with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. And as God said, I will dwell and walk among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch any unclean thing. And I will welcome you and I will be a father to you. And will be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. So then, dear friends, since we, since we have these promises, let us cleanse ourselves from every impurity of the flesh and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of the Lord. So this is why we should not no longer hang around the Methodist church and that and those things, because, you see, we can't yoke together with unbelievers. But, you see, because we know that the Lord has promised to be with us, to be in our midst, Right, as uh, and we become his holy place, right? We are his temple, so therefore we cleanse ourselves of all kinds of impurities. And so, the third thing is just as the Lord's glory promised to live with his people, so also he is renewing us as his people. So, he lives with us. God said, Let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of God's glory in the face of Jesus Christ. So, when the gospel comes to our heart. The glory of the Lord shines through us because it says, it speaks in our heart to bring light. And therefore, even our suffering is producing in us glory. Therefore, we do not give up even though our outer person is being destroyed, our inner person is being renewed day by day for our momentary light affliction is producing for us an absolutely incomparable eternal weight of glory. But you know, ultimately, the glory of the Lord will return to Jerusalem when Jesus returns, and we will also be revealed in his glory when he returns. See, when he returns, it will not be the Jerusalem of today in Israel. He will return with the Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem, and that will be our city. See, our citizenship is not in the Jerusalem in Israel today. Our citizenship is in the new Jerusalem in Christ. Okay? But when he returns with the new Jerusalem, then we will be raised immortal right listen this is paul in 1 corinthians 15 listen i'm telling you a mystery we will not all fall asleep we will all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we will be changed for this corruptible body must be clothed with incorruptibility and this mortal body must be clothed with immortality when the corruptible uh, body is clothed with incorruptibility uh, and this mortal body is clothed with immortality, then the saying that is written will take place, death has been swallowed up in victory. See, 
That is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Right? So those are the similarities between us and Ezekiel. The Lord has revealed his glory to us in Christ. The Lord's glory departed when Jesus departed to the right hand of God, but he promised to be with us to the end of the age. And we are renewed by that glory as it shines through us. And we will that glory will be revealed in us when Jesus returns in the new Jerusalem. Lord, we thank you for the words of these two prophets and how it can encourage us. I pray that you produce your glory in our lives. And I pray that um, you will continue to build us up and plant us, Lord Jesus, as people who fear you and as people whom you will find delight to follow all the time. And so please be with us in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay.